Good morning, church family. It's good to be together this morning. So glad you're in the house of the Lord as we continue on with our series, The Holy Spirit in You. This morning, we're going to be theming into the age of the Spirit. Now, when I say the age of the Spirit, we're not trying to find out how old the Holy Spirit is, but we're talking about the season or the era of the Holy Spirit's work on the earth. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, starting with verse 1. It says, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. Now, I remind you, this was written by the physician by the name of Luke. Luke also gives us the gospel of Luke. So he says, in my former book, in his gospel, the gospel of Luke, Theophilus, I wrote to you about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command— Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my Father. Wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak of. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father is set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now let's fast forward. Let's go to Acts chapter 2 for a moment, verses 1 and 2. It says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Welcome once again this morning to the fourth message now of our continuing series, The Holy Spirit in You. Now, so far in this series, we've investigated the personality of the Holy Spirit. You know, everyone has a personality, and sometimes we'll describe someone's personality by saying, oh, they're so sweet, or we'll say, you know, they're grumpy, Or we'll say they're impatient, or they're a patient person, or, you know, we have words to describe their personality. And we discovered that the personality of the Holy Spirit is described in the fruit of the Spirit. And so if I were to say to you today, my friend, the Holy Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, it would give you a picture of who the Holy Spirit is in his personality. And so the first week in our series, we talked about the personality of the Holy Spirit. Then the second week, we talked about the Holy Spirit's role in creation and how he brought divine order and how he brought beauty out of the original chaos of elements And the Bible says he did all of that by hovering over the face of the deep. So right in the beginning, the Holy Spirit was there. And then we talked about the Holy Spirit's ministry in the Old Testament last week. So last week, we discovered the fact that the ministry of the Holy Spirit literally spans from cover to cover of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, the very first book of the Bible, very first chapter of the Bible, second verse, it says that the Holy Spirit was hovering over the face of the waters, bringing divine order out of the chaotic state. And then as we go all through the Bible, all the way to the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, the last chapter, chapter 22 and verse 17, it says the Holy Spirit is seen here as beckoning men and women to partake of the water of life. 
So in the pages in between, the first and last books of the Bible, there are hundreds of references which directly relate to the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. We discovered there's 88 references in the Old Testament and 261 in the New Testament, making 349 different times that the Holy Spirit is referenced in the Bible. So my question this morning then, for all of us gathered here and those of us that are online, if the Holy Spirit was active in creation, if he was active all throughout the pages of the Old Testament, if he was active all throughout the New Testament, what is the Holy Spirit up to today? Now, some in response to that question would say, well, the work of the Holy Spirit is evidence in the book of Acts has come to a close at the end of the apostolic age with the death of the last apostle and the close of the apostolic age, the Holy Spirit no longer works on the earth. Others would say, well, the work of the Holy Spirit continues on. Continues on with the same power, the same fervency that you read about in the book of Acts and its many miracles that are recorded there and throughout the epistles of the New Testament. So I ask you then, who is right? Is it the one that says the Holy Spirit is gone, done, there's nothing more he is doing on the earth? Or is the one that would say that the book of Acts is still to be lived out? Matter of fact, it's interesting. All the other books of the Bible, they have a rather formal conclusion to them. The book of Acts has no formal conclusion, which lets me know that it's to be lived on. It continues on, and we're still, if you think about it in these terms, we're still living out the book of Acts. And, you know, if you look at it in your Bible, it will say the Acts of the Apostles. And I believe that we're still working out and still living out these wonderful works of God. So admittedly then, you know, these contrary positions can be rather confusing to a young believer, one that is trying to find truth about the Holy Spirit. Now, friends, I'll simply say this morning that as for me, I personally cannot understand the confusion regarding the Holy Spirit and his present ministry. I believe that the Word of God is very clear regarding the Holy Spirit's role in the life of the believer, in the life of the church, and in the world today. Now, I want to clarify a term as we get started here, and that term that is often bantered about in theology is dispensation. Here's the definition of dispensation. Dispensation refers to a period in history whereby God dealt with man in a very specific way. For example, you'll hear of the dispensation of innocence. It spans the time from the creation of man to the fall of man in the garden. And then you have the dispensation of conscience, which is from Adam and Eve's expulsion from the garden to the time of the worldwide flood. And then you have the dispensation of the law, which is from Exodus and the giving of the law to Moses, Moses to the people of God, expanding all the way up to the time of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then you have the dispensation of grace, which is from the resurrection to the present moment in which we live. If I were to give you all seven, there are literally seven different dispensations that most agree upon. Now, the term dispensation, then, is often interchanged with the phrase, the age of. So you can say the age of conscience, the agent or age of law, grace. And you can also put in the term era. So you might say the era of grace, era of conscience or grace or any one of these. Now, according to dispensationalists, the Old Testament period is the age of the Father. As you began to page through the Old Testament, starting there in the very first Genesis and making your way all the way to Malachi, what you discover is the primary agent that is working in the hearts of men and women is God the Father. And then as you go into the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
you'll discover that primarily who is working on the earth during this time or season is the person of Jesus Christ, God's only begotten son, sent on a mission to seek and to save the lost. And then as you continue on into the book of Acts, you'll discover from the time of Pentecost on, from that moment on, the primary ministry has been accomplished through the work of the Holy Spirit. Now the age of the Father, the age of the Son, and the age of the Holy Spirit, the primary ministry during that time was the Father of the Old Testament, Jesus' New Testament, and the Spirit of God now in this dispensation of which we live. Another term that can be used there is season. You know, we're all familiar with seasons here in Wisconsin especially. And I love all four seasons. I wish the winter was a little shorter, but nonetheless, you know, I enjoy them all. It's springtime now, and spring is slowly gonna give way to summer. Summer's going to, in September, October, give way into what we call fall, and fall is gonna give way into winter, and then it's gonna cycle back around again. And so we're familiar with it. We know no matter what the calendar says, whatever that day is on the calendar, spring starts the day, and you look outside, and the snow up to your eyeballs, you know that it's not precise, amen? And so you can't take seasons and put them into categories and say it starts now, ends there. There's an overlap in all of this. And so it is with the working of the Holy Spirit. Nearly every credible Bible scholar believes that the church was born on the day of Pentecost in the upper room there in Jerusalem. The ascension of Christ, which was followed by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church, gave way to a brand new and exciting age, the age of the Spirit. So we might say the age of the Spirit, the season of the Spirit's working, the era of the work of the Spirit, or the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. I want you to consider with me, first of all, the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus Christ. See, I believe that by carefully examining the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of Jesus, I believe that we can get a clear picture of the age of the Spirit and what it ought to look like and operate in our lives today. Everything regarding the life and ministry of Jesus is interwoven into interaction with the Holy Spirit. For example, let's look at a few. First of all, Jesus' birth was promised by the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, you'll find it was promised all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. It was right after Adam and Eve had sinned. And now they were on the run from God. Sin was separating them from their creator and separating them from God. And in that moment, you'll discover all the way back in the Old Testament, there was promise that one would come that would crush the head of the serpent. And that is the first indication of a coming Messiah that is going to rule over Satan, sin, death, hell, and the grave. And so we find these pictures all throughout the Old Testament. In this particular case, we're going to look at how the Holy Spirit promised and foretold the coming of the Messiah. There are actually some 312 different testimonies of the Spirit of God in the Old Testament that give us some kind of an indication of the coming and the season of the coming of the Messiah. Here's what it says in Isaiah chapter 11. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Now let me just kind of pause there for a moment. How many of you have ever cut down a tree or a tree is blown over in the wind and you've had a stump you had to deal with? I had a tree, it was actually a honeysuckle tree that broke off one day in my backyard. And uh, so I cleaned up the mess of all of that. And uh, it wasn't long afterwards, what appeared to be just a dead old stump started coming forth a little green shoot. And I thought to myself, I'm just going to see what this thing turns into. A few years later, it was a 35 foot tall tree that was the dirtiest, messiest tree you've ever seen. Your life. I should have cut right down at the ax at the, at the beginning. But this honeysuckle, it had these big old banana looking hard things, you know, and seeds were inside of them and it was a mess to clean up. And uh, what appeared to be a dead old stump 
produced this 35-foot tree, which I ultimately take down because I was afraid it was going to fall on the house. And then I want you to see how this ties in. It says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Who is Jesse? That is David's father. And from his roots, from the original roots there of David, a branch will bear fruit. The Son of God is going to come forth out of the lineage of Jesse and of David. Now let's look at what's going to happen. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. It's referring to Messiah. The spirit of wisdom. Notice how spirit is capitalized in each one of these, referring to the work of the Holy Spirit. So the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of power, and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So we find then, promised before the birth of Jesus Christ, even going all the way back into Genesis chapter 3, There's the promise of the coming of the Messiah. Secondly, I want you to see how Jesus' life, his physical life, was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Look at Luke chapter 1 for a moment. Luke chapter 1 is a portion of Scripture that we often read only at Christmas time. But I want you to see there's more to it than just the Christmas story here. Here's what it says, starting with verse 34. How will this be? This is a question that Mary asked the angel, and the angel said, you're going to bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. How will this be, she says. Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, here he is, one more time, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Notice there the Holy Spirit's role in the very conception of Jesus Christ. Setting aside the laws of genetics as we know them, God was going to break into time and space. He himself was going to come on a mission, and the mission is seeking to save the lost, to be the sacrifice for our sins so that we might be reconciled once again to God and come back into relationship and friendship with him. And so... You see the Holy Spirit involved in the conception of Jesus Christ. But I also want you to see how Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Take your Bibles, turn over just a few pages to Luke chapter 3. In Luke chapter 3, starting with verse 21, it says this, when all the people were being baptized. Now, this was by John the Baptist at the Jordan River. And so John the Baptist was baptizing. It says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. Here's one thing I want to just kind of parenthetically put in here. Jesus will never ask you to do something that he himself has not done. If he asks you to forgive, all you need to do is look at the cross. When from the cross he says, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. If Jesus says you need to love and And forgive, he has lived it out before us. And you'll find there's nothing that he requires of you that he himself has not done. And so it is with baptism. He was baptized by John the Baptist. And as he was praying, the heaven was open. I'm going to try to picture this now. This is a fabulous moment in church history. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Here's the Holy Spirit. One more time then. He was there before his birth, predicting his birth. He was the one that caused conception miraculously. And now here he is, he's baptizing him in the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit descended on him, that's Jesus, in a bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. Here's another parenthetical thought. Jesus, he paused and waited for the anointing of the Spirit before he went out to accomplish the mission that God had sent him on. The Bible says it wasn't until after his water baptism, it wasn't after spirit baptism, that he became actively involved in the ministry that the Father had sent him to, and that was to seek and to save the lost. 
So the Holy Spirit then in that moment said, you are my son whom I love. You are the one that I'm well pleased with. And Jesus is about 30 years old. Take note of that. Now, John chapter 3 and verse 34 fills in another blank for us. It tells us that the Holy Spirit anointing upon Jesus was without measure and without limits. The term Messiah and the term Christ. Messiah is the term that's used Old Testament referring to Christ, Jesus. And then you'll find Christ, which is the Greek form of the same which means the anointing or the anointed one. So Jesus then was anointed at his baptism and by the outpouring of the Spirit of God that came down upon him in the shape or form of a dove. And then he started his ministry. I want you to remember this. He paused until receiving this anointing before he went out and began to preach the gospel, raise the dead, open blinded eyes, all of this. He paused, because you're going to see something in a few moments. Remember what I just said. Now, Jesus' earthly ministry then was empowered by the Holy Spirit. From the synagogue in his hometown of Nazareth, Jesus chose to read this portion of Scripture, which is found in Isaiah chapter 61. Now, if you were a Jew during this time in the synagogue, you would have heard Isaiah 61 read and reread and read and reread and read and reread and read and reread -read time and time again. For 700 years, they had that prophecy. For 700 years, they had this recorded, that this was the will and the plan of Almighty God. Now listen to what happens when Jesus visits his home church with synagogue on the Sabbath day, which is Saturday. Here's what he does. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He takes the scroll and he begins to read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, the recovery of sight for the blind, and to release the oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor or the time of the Lord's acceptance. I think that's important too because I believe that there is a time when the Spirit of God calls us. If we reject the voice of the Lord, we have no guarantee that he'll ever knock on that door again. He has been faithful to nearly all of us in this room. But do not think that because he knocks today that he will knock tomorrow. We need to understand that out of the seven and a half billion of us on this planet right now, why should we be one that hears and rejects and do not listen time and time again when there are four billion persons that have never once heard the name of Jesus Christ? So get out of your mind this idea, this concept. It's all on my timetable. I choose when he's going to speak to me. I choose when I respond. My spirit, we looked at this a week ago, my spirit will not strive with man always. It will not compete with man always is what he says. And so the Bible tells us Jesus read this portion of scripture, which is the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 61 that they had had for 700 years. They were always looking, Messiah is coming, Messiah is coming, Messiah is coming, Messiah is coming, Messiah is coming. And Jesus reads this portion of scripture. Then he sits down in the synagogue And now he says something that's going to cause a great ruckus. He says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You've been watching, looking, looking down the long road for 700 years for Messiah. Messiah is here today. This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing this very day. And at that, they became so angry They took Jesus over to the cliff in Nazareth. Every time that I go to Israel, we go to Nazareth, and we go to that very cliff just as a reminder in the city of Nazareth where Jesus read this portion of Scripture, and they said, let's kill him. Let's get rid of him right now. He says he's Messiah. Messiah's coming, Messiah's coming, Messiah's coming. But in their mind, when Messiah came, they could not perceive him. 
And so in that moment then, you find that Jesus says today, the scripture is fulfilled in your very hearing. Look at Matthew chapter four for a moment, because Matthew gives us a record of Jesus' ministry and what he did and how he did that. Listen to what it says. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom. Friends, the kingdom of God is good news. And the message that Jesus shed, spread with them, was the good news of the kingdom. And healing every disease. Notice there's a differential here between disease and sickness. Healing every disease and sickness among the people. Definition of what Jesus was doing. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all that were ill with various diseases, those suffering with severe pain, demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. You know, when Peter is in uh, Caesarea, and he is testifying to Cornelius, Here's what he says in Acts chapter 10. He says, you know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism by, that John preached. Now God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went about doing good. If you want to just summarize what Jesus does in only two words, he always does good. Does good. So he went about, and the Bible says, doing good and healing all who are under the power of the devil because God was with him. So the Holy Spirit anointed Jesus of Nazareth, giving him authority over all the works of the enemy. Now take a look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. The Holy Spirit strengthened Jesus at Calvary. Have you ever wondered how Jesus could take the beating that he took and not getting angry? Have you ever wondered what was going on in the Garden of Gethsemane when he understood and knew it wasn't a guess, it wasn't some premonition, but it was the absolute knowledge that what was going to happen in just a few hours, he'd be arrested and then crucified in the most wicked way? Have you ever wondered how he could withstand all of that without getting angry? The Bible says he is reviled, and he reviled not again. Here's what the Bible tells us. In Hebrews chapter 9, and four, verse 14, Christ, through the eternal spirit, offered himself unblemished to God. Bible translations read this way, some of them, that the Holy Spirit was right there strengthening Jesus so that he might accomplish the perfect will of God, which was the salvation of man. The Holy Spirit was involved, not only while Jesus was on the cross, when Jesus said to the very ones who were crucifying him, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And then we find the Holy Spirit was involved in the resurrection. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. For Christ died for the sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. Aren't you glad that he came on that mission? He came to bring us to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the, say it, by the Spirit. One more time, but made alive by the Spirit. Friends, the Spirit brings life. The Spirit of God brings life. It did the same right at the beginning when Adam was formed from the dust of the ground. And like a mannequin, all things were in place, but nothing was alive. God put the breath, put the breath of life within him. And the Bible says he became a living soul. He became a living soul filled with God, the life of God, the Spirit of God. So do you get the picture here? The picture is, is the Holy Spirit was involved in every aspect of Jesus' life. It was the one that predicted that he was going to be born. It was the one that caused the conception to take place. It was the one that anointed him, and then from the anointing at the Jordan, he went forth into ministry. He was the one that gave him the strength and the power to forgive from the cross. And he was the very one that raised him from the dead. 
It's no wonder then that he commanded his disciples to wait. Remember what I said, Jesus, he waited in his ministry until the anointing of the Lord came upon him, which happened at the Jordan when he was baptized, both in water, but also when the heavens opened and baptized in the Spirit. It's no wonder, he said, you've got to do what I'm doing. You need to tarry in Jerusalem. I know that you may be all gun ho You've seen a lot. You've seen my crucifixion. You've seen my death. You've seen all of this. You've seen the resurrection. You've seen all of this. And you may be just chomping at the bit. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to tell everybody about it. He said, time out. I want you to tarry in Jerusalem. I want you to stay right here because you're going to go out into a hostile environment. The same hostile environment that crucified me is going to be one that's going to be hard as a rock when you try to talk to them. And it's going to take the anointing in order for your words to be heard. Friend, this world has a lot of words bouncing around. How many radio stations? How many television stations? How many social media spots? How many different websites? There's a lot bouncing around. There's a lot going on in all of our lives. And if we're going to be heard in this hour, you will only be heard as the Spirit of God places an anointing upon you. It's not by might. It's not by power. You need to stay in Jerusalem, he said, until you've been dude from on high with power. It's no wonder then, he said, wait. You know when the believers in the upper room, and that's a fascinating account in Acts chapter 2, when the believers in the upper room got what Jesus had, they began to do what Jesus did. You'll never do what Jesus did unless you have what Jesus had. You know, the Holy Spirit, first and foremost, all throughout Scripture, He infuses life. He gives life. In a world that's filled with death, a city that's filled with death, we need anointed men and women that are walking the streets of this city. And this summer, Pastor John has put together, we're going out on Sunday nights, rather than meeting on the South Lawn. We'll do some of that. But we're going to the heart of the city. We're going to have our services right in the heart of the city. Right where they're killing, right where they're destroying. There's some beautiful parks. And he's been investigating where we can go and where we safely can be. And we're going to bring the presence of Christ into the city. We're not going to hide behind doors. We're going out where the need is. The Holy Spirit infuses life. If you feel dead inside of your soul today, he will give you life. Suddenly, just like that mannequin-like person that would be formed of the dust of the ground became a living soul, you'll sense life on the inside like you've never known before. The Holy Spirit gives joy. You know, this world doesn't give joy. If you are in the stock market, you're not getting any joy. The joy suckers are running everywhere. And it's just like, you know, you just kind of get your head above water emotionally. And then all of a sudden somebody comes and they put their big old sucker tank on you. And and you just feel like, Holy Spirit, he gives joy. Joy and strength run hand in hand in the scripture. The Bible says, the joy of the Lord is my what? That's right. So if you rob a person of their joy, you can rob them of their strength. The Holy Spirit brings joy. And he's going to bring joy, which brings strength for the journey. The Holy Spirit empowers believers for service. Friends, we will never be able to accomplish what we've been called to accomplish. Your giftings and your talents in and of themselves they will never produce what God expects to be produced 
apart from the anointing of the Holy Spirit. This is the dispensation. This is the age. This is the era. This is the season of the Holy Spirit. And friends, we dare not miss it. Next Sunday, we're going to be talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There are nine gifts of the Spirit. There's nine fruit of the Spirit. There's nine manifestations of praise that we read about in Scripture. We're going to talk about the nine gifts of the Spirit on Sunday. Here's what I want you to do. All week long, I want you to have a heart that just begins to say, Lord, help me to hunger and thirst after life-giving gifts for our community. Not only for the community within the church, but on the outside. Jesus said, I want you to take a time out. I want you to wait. Don't run out there and try and do it on your own strength or you'll fail. You can go out there with the greatest message in the world, which the gospel is. And without the anointing, it sounds no different than somebody reading from the Quran. It just sounds like so many words. But when the Spirit of God rests upon you, when you speak, all of hell begins to separate. And suddenly, suddenly the ears that could not hear, the Holy Spirit has a way of opening up the ears and they begin to hear. And it's not of us, it's of Him. It's not our talents or our skills or abilities. It's our skills and abilities, God-given, that we surrender back to Him and say, Lord, these I bring to you. Put your anointing on me so that I can go out and make a difference in this world.